Uh, it's nice to see such a great turnout today, uh, and I want to welcome people here. Uh, for those that I haven't met before, my name is Eric Nordberg, and I'm the Dean of Libraries here at uh, UTM. I started in February. I want to warn you up front that this event is being live streamed, and it is being recorded for uh, uh, replay later. So anything that you say out loud may be captured, so try to be cautious about what you say. Um, for those that don't get into our building that often, I shouldn't miss the opportunity to talk about the library, and not just the Paul Meek Library, but the library system, and, and really what we do in support of students and faculty across the UTM family. So not just here on the Martin campus, but I've been off with Erica visiting the regional campuses recently, and we support students regardless of their location. Um, I think people tend to think about libraries as content collectors, uh, but of course we do provide a lot of services. Uh, those are services ranging from uh, helping people locate uh, information, uh, reference kind of traditionally, uh, but also a lot of instruction. Aaron Weber's here in the audience. Raise your hand there, Aaron. If anybody, if anybody here is looking to help their students understand how to access uh, materials, Aaron's the person to go to. We're more than willing to turn up in a classroom, in a Zoom room, uh, via email or chat, uh, because really our goal is not just to collect things, but uh, to really help people understand how to find information, how to evaluate information resources, how to select the things that are the best quality for the work that they're doing, and also how to incorporate that. I see Kelly Alden's here from the Writing Center. We partner very closely. Uh, you know, this is really about skill building for our students to locate information. These are not just things to get papers done, but to actually take out into the real world when they're uh, alumni, graduates, and professionals. Um, I should also say that we are a space. This is a building, and we do have library spaces at uh, some of our regional campuses. Uh, of course, study is something that we encourage, uh, but also spaces are useful for all sorts of other types of learning and exchange. And the latter, that exchange, is why we're here today. Uh, because we want this to be a space where people learn things, where they get involved with uh, exchanging information with others and uh, learning from those experiences. So you're going to see that we're going to be doing a lot more of that activity. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we're going to do it in this space and we're going to jazz things up a bit so we don't have old clunky furniture like this, uh, but maybe a little slicker uh, presentation opportunities. But we're going to be doing more of that. So keep an eye on our website, keep an eye on our, our uh, Facebook feed, uh, and other social media, and uh, please feel welcome to, to come here. Uh, some of those events will be things that the library generates, but others will be things that we host with other organizations or co-host uh, co or partner, and today's a good example of that. Uh, this event is being co-sponsored by the UTM chapter of Phi Kappa Phi, of which I'm a member and was pleased to find that there was a chapter here. Uh, and to introduce our speaker, I'm going to ask uh, the Phi Kappa Phi President, Carrie Humphreys, to come up and say a few words. All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. So as the current president of our UT Martin chapter of the Honor Society of Phi Kappa Phi, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. So Dr. Amina April Mella Alcazar, who goes by April, is currently the university president of the University of Pasig City in Metro Manila, Philippines. The university has 10 baccalaureate programs and approximately 5,000 students. She is now on a Fulbright senior scholarship here at UT Martin to conduct advanced research on models of American community colleges and their possible adoption in the Philippines. April's field of study is business administration, and she finished her Bachelor of Science in Business Administration, cum laude, at the University of the Philippines, where she became a member of Phi Kappa Phi in 1989, as well as Pi Gamma Mu Honor Society. She went on to graduate with a Bachelor of Laws degree from the same university and became a member of the Philippine Bar in 1994. Besides being a university scholar, April first made her foray into the international sphere during her college years as well. She started with activities utilizing her writing abilities with prizes in the Chilean Writing Contest in Valparaiso, Chile, and Japan Airlines Writing Contest in Tokyo, Japan, 
while submitting her papers for presentation at the International University Congress in Rome, Italy, and at the Pi Gamma Mu annual convention held at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. She went on to take a dual technology program under the auspices of the International Association of Students in Business and Economics at the University of Bayreuth in Bavaria, Germany. For 18 months, and then she spent six months at the association's international headquarters in Brussels, Belgium, as a member of the International Congress auditing team. It was also in college that April studied foreign languages, including Spanish, Japanese, German, and French, in addition to her mother tongues, Filipino and English. After becoming a lawyer, April became a legal resident agent for international companies who had developed projects in the Philippines. She represented principals from the United States, France, Germany, Spain, Switzerland, and Japan, negotiating their contracts and investments in the Philippines. She then went on to study her master's in business administration and doctorate in business administration at Tohoku University in Japan for six years as a scholar of the Japanese Ministry in Education. She was also a recipient of the Association of Overseas Technical Scholarship under the Japan Patent Office for Intellectual Property and an Asian scholar of the Japanese Association of Language Teachers. Moreover, April was an expert lecturer for the German Academic Exchange Council on Business Analytics in Germany and one of the first presenters to the IBM Big Data Conference, now known as Insight, first held in Las Vegas. She was also part of the mission of Filipino University Presidents to Canada to research community colleges. All throughout her career as a student, lawyer, senior manager, academic, and administrator, April has always let the love of learning, which is part of Phi Kappa Phi's motto, and advocacy for international relations be her guiding lights. We are so fortunate to have her with us today. Please, a welcome round of applause for Dr. April Alcazar. Thank you so much, Carrie, for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. So I see some very familiar faces that I've met all throughout my stay here at uh, UTM. So I arrived here on the 3rd of April. I had to actually quarantine for the first uh, two weeks that I was here. So very much uh, organized by our international officer, Stephanie. And so all throughout this uh, time that I've been here almost 10 weeks, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my experience here in UTM. And for today, it's less of a lecture, I think. It's not really an academic lecture, but more, I, I believe, an inspirational um, talk, which I hope will lead to our advocacy, both for the Phi Kappa Phi uh, Honor Society, as I've uh, Scary has already mentioned, so I was so happy to see those three letters when I entered the library. So uh, something very familiar to me. And at the same time also, um, all throughout this journey, I wanted to tell you about how um, I would like to advocate to bring the world to UTM and from a global affairs perspective. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own personal journey, how um, I was able to develop a kind of global mindset, and at the same time, how we can take the steps to really bring the world to UTM. So very fittingly, so I requested that I conduct um, this <coughs> talk in the library because it's kind of a home of sorts for me. First, they gave me the space here. So every day, uh, almost I'm here in the library. So in the last three months and until next month, so I'm hoping that within this approximately 100 days that I'm here at the library, so I'm very much at home. Um, here and then, of course, co-sponsored by the Phi Kappa Phi because I wanted to expound a little bit on um, our motto, which is let the love of learning rule humanity. And lastly, of course, to co-sponsor it with the Department of Global Affairs from the College of Business, of which I have that background and also because of the experiences that I had. So very fittingly, I'll begin this talk with a book because we are in the library. <laughs> so... Um, <coughs> So uh, I told Eric, Dr. Norberg, this very interesting story about this book that I had read when I was a senior in high school. And I told him, do not report me to the International Librarians Association. And he said, no, there's, a, there's another book about books, library books that have been unreturned. And there are many stories why they were not returned by, uh, by those who borrowed the book. So this book is... Um, 
was written around 70 years ago, and it's called Ease of Home. And as you can see, there's even, says there's high school library because I still really have the book with me. Of course, I made a very substantial donation to my high school on the 35th anniversary of, uh, of my uh, graduation. And yeah, it was, of course, printed in the United States. And I'll give a little bit of a background about this author. So the author was an Indian author, Rashna, okay? So um, in the next slide, as you can see, so this is the... <clears throat> This is the author, so she's an Indian national. And just a little bit of a, just a reminder, in this particular map, the Philippines, this is the map. I had an earlier lecture on June 12. Some of you attended that, but this is uh, the Philippines. But I will not be discussing the Philippines today, but it is in the middle of Southeast Asia, where I'm from. And this book made such an impact on me because it was written by an Indian author who had spent almost all her formative years from elementary to university being educated in England. So she was writing about Asia from uh, being an Asian, but from a Western perspective she, because she was very much steeped in <clears throat> the post-colonial value of education from England. So that was very interesting for me. And of course, it was written in English. And this made such an impact on me because she had a very detailed account about her travels as well as the acute observations that she made in this particular book. And so where did she actually go? So in this book, she had the opportunity to actually go, next slide please, um, to go to these countries in Asia. So in an earlier book, she had written about her rediscovery of her Indian roots in a book called The Long Way Home because um, she had to rediscover about her Indian roots. So why she um, made the title East of Home because obviously all of these countries are located east of India. <clears throat> so that's why she visited Japan, China, Indochina, Siam, because this was post-World War II, so Thailand hadn't changed officially its name, and then in Indonesia. So she spent almost two years traveling to all of these countries. And um, maybe part of the reason was because I aspired to travel in the same way that she had described her travels, because she was very much immersed. She had an immersive experience in all of the travels that she did. She studied the languages first and foremost, and then she had different interactions with the peoples of those particular countries that she lived in. And very distinctly, <clears throat> she also involved herself with the different aspects of each of the cultures that she found herself in that she was interested in, which is basically education and the arts. So obviously, Dr. Norberg, that was the reason why I took this book with me as a memento of my graduation from high school. <laughs> so from this book, of course, um, I aspired to be like this author, Santa Rama Rao, and I really thought about like, okay, what would happen to me after I leave high school because I was going to go off to college. So that's what happened. The following year, I went off to college. And I think um, in the first year that I was there, um, of course, the very first transformative element that happened to me when I went to university was it really opened up the freedom of the mind for me. I had from a very regimented, intellectual regimentation, I went to a Catholic girls' school. So then I had the freedom in a public university to really discover and be intellectually curious and try to stretch the levels of what my intellectual curiosity will bring me. So when I say that the library is really a home of sorts for me, it's because that's where I did the intellectual wandering the voyages, that's when it actually started. And it was, I think, also in my freshman year in university that I started to be on the path towards becoming a leader. Of course, I mentioned this to Dr. Norbert, and he said, oh, you're a joiner, right? Yes, I am, because to become a leader, you have to first learn how to become a follower. So I think that's what happened to me in the first year that I was in university, but that's what happened to me is the subject of a totally different lecture about leadership. 
So in the second year, um, I started really to join all of these student organizations. And one of the student organizations that I joined was a religious organization, okay? I went to a public university, but it's not very unusual in the Philippines because majority of our population is 80% Catholics, and then we have a lot of Christian denominations. So to join a religious organization is not very unusual for young people. But what was unusual about this particular religious organization was its international affiliation. So because of that, um, this organization had many networks of charities. So just two years after I read this very influential book, I was, I think, on my way to the International Relations Global Affairs Foray because I then experienced at 17 years of age what I would always dub as the summer of my life. Because for four months of that year, in the Philippines, our summer holiday begins usually in March because our um, summer season actually is April and May. That's the reason why I'm nicknamed April because my other name in, in Tagalog, in our native language, means gentle breeze. And the gentle breeze blows in the month of April. So that's the reason. So for four months of that year, um, I went with my religious organization, and we were immersed in activities with the charities that they had a network with. So because this is a Catholic uh, organization, so we went to Italy, to Spain, to France, and to England. So it is through this interaction, of course, I had seriously started to study Spanish and French by this time, because in the Philippines, because of our colonial history, so we were actually studying Spanish during our freshman year. And of course, French being a Romance language is related to Spanish, so it's a natural progression to also study another Romance language. So during these four months, I really experienced what I would say as an immersive experience. That is really first-hand experience with respect to the cultures of a people, not as a tourist, but someone who will experience culture of what the people are in a particular place. And of course, because we were involved in charities, then definitely it's not always the good side of those particular places that we will be seeing. So from that particular experience, I believe I was really on my way now thinking like, okay, how is it then that I could develop a global mindset or a global perspective. And since my interest, even in college, was in academics and in writing, so uh, you're from the writing center, so I joined many international competitions um, that utilized my writing skills and, of course, joined many student congresses and conventions that gave me that opportunity to represent my country. So it's very different. Uh, I mentioned that one of the first um, cities that I visited in the United States was in Birmingham. The reason being that we had a convention for the Phi Gamma Mu in um, University of Alabama, which they hosted. So the most memorable thing that I remember is that I didn't meet anyone who looked like me when we had the convention, and this was in 1990. So, so I think from all of these experiences, by the time I finished um, university and college and I was thinking about like what I would eventually do, of course, um, I decided I wanted to study law. So that was another possible foray um, into a field that would give me the opportunity to go and have international relations. So all of those experiences that I had during the formative years before I was 20 years old, and I always emphasize this to my students, that this is the period of time that is most impressionable and influential in what you may possibly do um, yourself in the future. Whatever it is that you're going to be experiencing before you're 20 until you're 25, that I think will definitely mark you for the rest of your life. So by the time I was uh, 20 years old, I, I think that I had already kind of decided what I really wanted to do and to always involve myself with activities, whether it be as a professional or in a personal level, that always had this global mindset in mind. So at 21, I think I was ready to leave for the first biggest adventure at the time of my life, which was then I went to the other side of the world in Germany on my own um, and spent 18 months in the dual technology course in the University of Bayreuth, which at the time was only 10 years old. It was like one of the most 
um, we sent universities that had been put up by at the time immediately after the just 10 years after the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall. So this was a very historic time uh, for me. And uh, <coughs> I told Eric, okay, I'm going to show them a little bit of that period of time just because I felt that that was a very influential and impressionable part of my life that sort of determined a little bit of the path that I eventually took. So I hope that I'm still looking very similar to the person <laughs> that's in the photos. <laughs> that's my uh, hope. So this was a very, um, I think, historic time. First, uh, when I was in college in the Philippines, I mentioned this when I was a freshman, this was in 1985. So this was the time when Mr. Marcos was actually um, in the process of being uh, ousted from our national government. And so in my first year in college, I was involved in student activism. Um, and then the following um, years that transpired, I think there was a lot of interest in the Philippines. Oh, okay, so thank you. Thank you, Eric. So I'm hoping this is the same. Uh, I still always had my usual uniform, which is a blazer until now. It's still the same. Um, so as I mentioned, um, so this was the ISEC, the International Association of Students in Business and Economics in Brussels before it became the capital of the European Union. So it wasn't as expensive. Though, so eventually they had to move out and move to Rotterdam because it was too expensive for the student organization to be there. Um, then, of course, um, even prior to that, because we were in the Asia-Pacific region, so I was attending a lot of conferences in the Asia-Pacific region. And again, I look back at like that influential book and say that it's different when you're in this particular region of the world and you're looking at a very diverse area. Um, you might think that Asia-Pacific region is um, homogeneous, and yet there are so many cultures countries, uh, languages in this very diverse region. So right now, of course, it's the most populous region in the world with um, the most of economic development uh, in the area. And, okay, I think you did the loop, so this was very fast, okay. So, and then, of course, by this time, in 1993, I had become a law student. So I was uh, working as a research assistant for the Institute of Human Rights, and of course, one of those countries that really pushed for that will be Sweden. So obviously I did a paper and did a presentation about the status of like human rights um, in the Philippines to represent the Philippines. Then eventually I think it was mentioned that um, I joined, um, I studied in um, Tohoku University, which is located in, in Sendai. This is the area where they had the tsunami and the earthquake um, in 2011 and spent six years there for my master's and my PhD on business administration. So we started with a cohort of 18. By the time it's 2006, there's only four of us <laughs> uh, finishing the doctoral. And then I remember this particular lecture that I gave in this university in Japan. The reason being that this is supposed to have been the original site of the um, place where the atomic bomb was going to be dropped in Hiroshima. And the only reason why it did not end up in the history books is there was a cloud that was hanging over and there was zero visibility. So everywhere that I go, I try to find what is like so unique about the places that I visit or even the people that populate that. So one of the most interesting places that of course I wanted to visit in Tennessee was Oak Ridge, naturally. So which is like one of the first thing that I wanted to see, obviously. Then here, um, so here I mentioned about Tennessee. What was my first um, interaction with Tennessee was because I was um, contacted by the Tennessee Renewable Energy and Economic Development, which is actually based in UT Knoxville um, in 2014. So they wanted to initiate an international exchange program with the Philippines because the Philippines has one of the highest cost of electricity in the Asia Pacific region. And of course, they had a lot of incentives to promote renewable energy. So that was my first um, jaunt here to Tennessee. And we, we did a one month um, immersive tour of all of these renewable energy facilities here, uh, including uh, being um, sponsored by the Tennessee Valley Authority. 
and the different um, companies that actually use renewable energies in Tennessee. Besides, of course, going to Jack Daniels and to Graceland, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> okay, so, so I think uh, from all of these pictures that I was showing you, so definitely to my mind, um, so in Budapest, this was, this was memorable to me because it was the first of the openings of the Eastern European countries. So I remember the reason why we had the Congress there because the, you, the Hungarian government was actually providing and subsidizing the International Congress because they were really promoting the country. And so all of these many experiences really tried to develop a global mindset in me, which is, I think, an open, a curious mind, an expansive worldview that one can be actually very much accepting of diversity and other people's cultures, opinions, and viewpoints, but at the same time, keeping your own distinct cultural heritage, which is what I always try to do whenever I go um, anywhere to introduce the Philippines and what makes our country very distinctive. So that to me would be more of the international relations or global affairs perspective that I wanted to talk about with my talk. So now I go to the second part. So how do you think it would be possible if one didn't have these kinds of experiences or opportunity, would it still be possible to actually develop this kind of mindset? And how would we bring the world to UTM? So now I'm going to show you a little bit of another, of another um, set of slides that uh, I tried to prepare while during my time here in the UTM. And one of the um, most, I think, um, techniques that I have done in order for me to really get to know more of a place is to really have different interactions with different kinds of people from a particular country or community or city. And so I always give, because normally I would teach a quantitative methods class, so I always try to imbue my students with a kind of positive attitude to numeracy that they could always find something practical in their lives when they think about mathematics or numbers. So every day I give myself a quota of 15 minutes to interact with someone new, okay? It doesn't matter who it may be, but that's usually what I do. So if I, if I actually interacted for 15 minutes every day, so from Monday to Fridays, because I'm assuming I'm just here in the library Monday to Fridays, I have to take the weekends off. <laughs> So that would be an hour and 15 minutes, right, um, every week. So by the time that I finish, for example, my um, 16 weeks or 12 weeks, whatever, how long I may be in a place, I would have spoken to at least, at the very least, if I did like an hour, at least 10, if not 12 new people or even more. Because normally in my job, and I keep on saying this, so as a university president, and I have been for the last 10 years, what do you usually do? And I go like, well, you really have to talk to a lot of people. Th that's what you actually have to do most of the time, right? <laughs> so you really, uh, so it will not be unusual actually for you to be talking to 20 people every single day uh, when you're on the job. And so this is kind of like a rest for me because if you're only doing 15 minutes talking to one person, okay, then it's not really such a stressful job to do, right? So what I did is that I've been having all of these spontaneous um, exchanges, interactions, and also one of the things that I've done since the pandemic was to actually do this virtual broadcast because as you know, we had to suspend our classes. There is no face-to-face -face contact. And so one of the most effective ways is to actually reach our students or our community through social media. So since last year, I've been doing this virtual broadcast. So I just have to say that in a previous incarnation, I had a job in broadcasting. So that's another story altogether. So because of that, um, so what I do, and this is even very effective ever since um, I was in college, is that you get to interview people. Interview in the sense that you exchange something interesting or topical with them. And so I'm going to show you a little bit of what I have documented. This doesn't involve all the other undocumented interviews that I had, but these are some of the people that I have interviewed in the course of my stay here in UTM. Eventually, I will write down the transcriptions of what I have actually discussed with them, but it, could, it had varied from leadership to educational management 
to outreach programs through their life here as a student um, and so on as an administrative staff. So this is like some steps that I propose to take eventually when I discuss it after the slide of what we can do to bring the world to UTM. Yes, please. Yes, and there is sound as well. So this is care of our um, choir member from our University of Pasig City. So I had to request her after her final examination. So pardon the, the voice, I think. <laughs> Uh, anniversary of the 75th Independence Day of the Philippines from the American colonial government. <laughs> so the audience was mostly from the Governor's School of Agriculture. I also requested the members from my university to join us through Zoom. So there's a 13 hour difference, so they had to wake up early on a Sunday morning <laughs> to join us. So I remember this song because I went down to Nashville and I think one of the best souvenirs that I will take away from UTM is my identification card because it says they're students. So when I went to a bar in Nashville, they asked me for my ID and I go like, really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yes, I did show my UTM ID card. <laughs> yes. So. So now I was saying about like how do we bring the world um, to UTM, which is um, what I wanted to actually advocate for in this particular talk. So I think firstly, of course, this is a university, so uh, we are student center, I hope. <laughs> so, so for the students, definitely, I would encourage for them to join um, student organization, again, being a joiner, Eric, so whether whatever their interest is, whether it be sports, arts, academics, or volunteer organization, because it really provides you the affiliation and a possibility to join this activity. So if it's Pi Kappa Phi, obviously this is an academic uh, organization. So there are many permutations of the kind of exposure and immersion that students can actually benefit from. Besides the leadership skills training, of course, it's the exposure to the particular interest that you are in. 
for on campus, as um, Dr. Norberg was saying, I think it will be really good to have this kind of activities wherein you can even invite. Already the resources that are here in the university, your faculty members, your administrative staff. So in the course of my stay here, I discovered that um, there's a faculty member who met his wife through the Fulbright Scholarship. She was a Fulbright Scholar from Hungary. So I go like, you have to talk about Hungary, okay, to some of your colleagues here in the university or someone who met his wife, on the other hand, when he went to study abroad, okay, another interesting personal story. Besides all of the experiences of um, the people in the community already of their exposure and what they can share with the community. Of course, on a policy level, if, if you go to the administration, then you will have to actually think about international exchange programs, study abroad, or really developing a collaborative research or outreach programs for students and faculty to participate in. On a policy level, naturally, there must be some budget manpower or facilities that are going to be allocated um, for these activities to be conducted. And definitely, of course, because this is also the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright, so I have to emphasize to um, the academic activities such as that, that conducted by Phi Kappa Phi to really invite more academics, resource persons, scholars, and to provide diversity through faculty and international students coming to the university in order to provide more of a global mindset. So I think with all of those, I hope that um, you have been given in a nutshell about my experiences, both on a personal level and a professional level, so that it will be possible for everyone to have an open, curious mind and develop a global mindset and bring the world to UTM. So thank you so much for your time for this afternoon, and it was a pleasure for me. Yes, actually, yeah. Ah, okay, yeah. So, so John is asking. So he's uh, very interesting. The treasurer of Phi Kappa Phi, right? <laughs> so, uh, yes. <laughs> so he wanted to ask about the Japan Airlines. So I remember this very distinctly. In 1987, they had an essay writing contest, and the reason why what what we were supposed to write about, like, what did you think about? Philippine-Japan relationships, obviously we had a uh, history, a shared history of World War II, right? Uh, but, but this was open only to college students, so they were not really expecting like a historical treatise about it. And then I said that even though we had a shared history and this was kind of like an acrimonious history, um, because 30 years after, Japan had become the biggest trading partner of the Philippines by that time. So I was emphasizing more about um, the opportunities that could be made available. So as a prize, what happened was I spent uh, August to September of that year in Sophia University in Japan. That was the prize of the essay writing contest. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think it's not really about like seeking so much like the monetary value because actually those experiences are actually priceless. You can't really price them. But it's the opportunity when there is the time and the possibility that will really provide you that immersive experience, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Yes, Todd. Previously, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> here well actually it's not exactly like the first one but I would say more Todd about being in Tennessee itself like people will have this idea about Tennessee being one country music right so it's very near Nashville so that's one when they tell oh you're going to Tennessee so you're gonna know about country music. So they were kind of surprised that I would be very familiar 
with country music, the traditional one, but in the Philippines, the older generation would be very much familiar with the older um, traditional country music because they would have these jukeboxes from the time of the Americans and they would play the country music, right? So, so I think what was surprising to me was that not many Americans actually appreciate about country music, right? So that's one. <laughs> Yeah, obviously, right? Do you know like this? No, they have no idea. Some of them, they have no idea. So that was one. And then secondly, of course, it's because if you describe about kind of middle America to people outside of like this region, they would always have this idea about Hollywood movies or the New York Minute. So is it anything like that? And I would go like, absolutely not, <laughs> right? So I really have to explain that that is a very small part of what the United States is, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's why you have to bring the world to UTM, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> So he didn't put Jack Daniels on the refreshments, okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so kindly try it. the salt and the sweet from the Philippines. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay.